We are absolutely delighted to launch the Spring Book Sandwiched In series with the review of Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. Former First Lady Michelle Obama's number one New York Times bestselling memoir gives readers a forthright, authentic view of the early years of her marriage, her approach to balancing work and family in her increasingly public roles, and her time in the White House. And our presenter today is Dr. Danielle Lyman Torres. Dr. Lyman Torres is the Commissioner of Recreation and Youth Services for the City of Rochester. A Rochester native, Dr. Lyman Torres has a doctorate in executive leadership and has led community service agencies for 20 years. Please join me in welcoming her to our podium. Well, good afternoon. Allow me to transition us from this to, from your commercial break here, to the actual slideshow. If it is still here. Not sure what happened. It was up, got minimized, and doesn't seem to be there. Maybe, maybe it's there. Oh, there it is. It's hiding on me. All right. Made me afraid for a minute, which doesn't happen easily. I was here early to set up for this. All right. Well, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. And um, I see some familiar faces and many faces I, I am happy to, to meet and engage with for the first time. Um, when I was asked about uh, this particular book and this review, um, I was excited to do that because it, it was certainly one of the um, hot topics at the time that I was uh, asked to do this. It was flying off the shelves, and that's one of the things that we will, we will talk about in the success of the book as a part of this review. So no surprise that many people know a lot about the author. But we'll pretend like you don't and start with a traditional book review where we talk about the author. Um, it is important to, to understand uh, the author. This is the third book that, um, you know, is something that Michelle was a part of. This one she wrote, um, also a book about her garden had come out in 2012, as well as some of her compiled speeches in 2009. Now, there are many other books about her, but this is the third book uh, of her, her own penmanship. Um, she is a Chicago native, which I think most people have learned, um, a Princeton University graduate, a Harvard Law School graduate, uh, went into corporate law. Um, from there, went into city government um, as a, a commissioner of planning for the city of Chicago. Uh, she then became the executive director of a nonprofit that was the Chicago Office of Public Allies, which she talks about that experience. From there, um, going on into higher education, working for the University of Chicago as an associate dean of students, staying in that University of Chicago system, then transitioning to the medical center in her last position prior to becoming the First Lady of the United States of America. And she is also mother and wife to some also pretty famous people. I think you'll know. So let's talk about the book's success. So it was already denoted that it was a New York Times bestseller, number one. I think it also should be noted that it was the um, most, it had the most book sales in 2018 in the United States, and it came out in November of 2018. <laughs> that's a lot, that, that's a, a lot of sales from November and December. And um, the reason why I selected this picture is because this other woman <laughs> holding the book um, who puts her O stamp on the front of books, catapults them into bestsellers on her, in her own way. So while it may, of course, have been a bestseller in its own right, um, having Oprah select your book 
and endorse your book has been uh, something that has been meaningful for authors since she started the book club in 1996. So um, the Oprah Book Club was an important endorsement. But more than three million copies have sold. Um, and it is also notable that it is the best-selling political memoir um, of all time. So that beats out all those presidents that also <laughs> wrote books. You know, the actual presidents. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a really phenomenal, um, it's had phenomenal success, so much so that she's had to extend her book tour as well into this year um, because it's just been um, phenomenally successful and continuing. Now, I know many people own the book, um, but haven't maybe yet read the book or maybe have been given the book as a gift. And I, I know from an informal survey that we're kind of all across the spectrum in the room today. Um, and that's okay. Uh, I certainly will leave you with my recommendation um, at the end of this conversation. Ooh, this way. So I wanted to s reflect before going through the sections of her book and the structure of her book, really talking about the essence of why she selected this framework in which to write the book. She chose a memoir. And not just because everyone else has written a memoir. There's a, there are specific reasons um, she alludes to in her preface of the book, never really explicitly says, but it's something that I took away from reading the preface of this book, is that the reason why she wanted to, you know, really relay this as a memoir is it's, it's so very different than a biography. A biography is very chronological and very chronological. Um, it's very factoid. It's very, um, you know, not something you connect to. It's something that you learn. You read and you learn the pass of time. While a memoir really seeks to emotionally and intimately connect you to the life experience of a person as they've perceived it, which is really important because the way you perceive your life it's not maybe exactly how it went, <laughs> um, but it's how you perceived how you lived your life. Um, I know that because I say things sometimes and my mother will say, that's not what happened. And I say, that's how I thought it happened. <laughs> and so that's going in my memoir, <laughs> just like I thought it did. So it really was that point of view. And it's really interesting that this is a photograph that she chose to include in this book because to me, it really symbolized the reflective process that she underwent in the creation of this memoir. Um, you know, and just this, this really penciful, thoughtful um, way. And there's some qualities about a memoir that are therapeutic. And choosing to write this at a time after being the first lady for eight years um, one would maybe understand why there would be some need for therapy, um, <laughs> particularly in this day and age where, where being in that role um, is, you know, under that kind of fishbowl scrutiny than, than any other generation had ever experienced. And so just the ability to therapeutically reflect on how did I get here? Um, now that I have some quiet time to think. I also think, um, and this is something that I, I see as a theme that runs through the book, and I'll talk about this, is that she comes from a very teaching place. She wants to ensure that um, people take away these teachable moments. And she was such a, such a studious person, is such a studious person, and, it come, that comes through in her own depiction of her life. But that this opportunity to write a memoir wasn't really just to be sensational, but to be thoughtful and um, really expressive about what people could learn from her experience, good and bad, good and bad. And then there's this part of keeping memories alive, the memories of her family the memories of her father, 
the memories of her great aunt Robbie, the memories of her childhood with her mother, um, and the memories of her young adulthood and um, you know, budding relationship with her husband. I think these are all things that drive people to consider a memoir um, in a more thoughtful way. And, and I see these as the, the reasons why um, she created this book. Um, and, and she could have done it, told her story in a variety of ways, but this is the way that she selected to do that. So now I'll spend a great deal of time talking about the structure of the book. If you haven't read it, it is 426 pages, so make some time. It's a <laughs> Make some time. Um, and it does cover her life from birth to present, as one might expect. But she's crafted this in a three-phase way that really resonates with me because I like to keep things simple. She has a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> and that's, it's really easy to follow along in that, that way. You know where you are. There's no chronological jumping. You don't have to guess what decade she's talking about. It's a very clear distinction. It also helps to develop how she made decisions throughout her life. She starts with the Becoming Me section, talking about her birth, her childhood, um, you know, living in a two-parent home, albeit a shared space uh, above her great aunt, Robbie, who gave piano lessons loudly below, and uh, sharing a space with her slightly older brother, Craig, uh, and, and the, the, just the pleasantries and joys of their family are very clearly depicted in each and every word she selects. She had by all accounts, a very wonderful childhood. She figured out her own willful spirit by taking piano lessons from that great Aunt Robbie, who let her know every step of the way she was doing it wrong. Um, and she really wanted to continue to challenge, challenge that. And really, that, that she credits that was sparking this strong desire in herself to get it right and to prove that she can get it right. I think it's a, a, a telling piece right in the beginning where she talks about kindergarten and you know, really wanting to prove she could read better than everybody else in the class. And she stumbled on a word and then insisted the next day that they go back to that word so that she could prove to the class who was not paying attention <laughs> that she could actually read this word and really immersed herself in high achievement academically without, even, without being asked to, just something that she wanted to do. She wasn't surrounded by Rhodes Scholars and she wasn't surrounded by people who pressured her to get these grades and to obtain these things. She just wanted to. This was a, a level of achievement she set for herself. So she, she did have this um, really wonderful childhood. She talks about, at the age of 10, um, standing up to a bully in a way that we don't promote today, which is to punch the bully in the face. Um, although I can picture it and laughed as I read that, um, because that, that was a, a, a real vivid story of her own standing her ground. She was astute to notice as a young person the changes in the Chicago community around her, the changes in the families, the families that lived in her neighborhood, the changes in the demographics, um, the suburban flight of um, you know, many of her childhood classmates year after year, looking very different, feeling very different. Um, looking less and less diverse. She remembered and recalled all of those pieces of her family and her childhood with so much clarity, you, you felt like you were watching a show. 
can tell you that. And um, I can also tell you that while that is, it's, it's all wonderful, if you're waiting for some tragic event that you think would have shaped her into who she is, you won't find that. She did not have a tragic upbringing. I know that many people expect that that's our stories, and for some of us it is. But it wasn't for her. And she very clearly tells that story without telling you you're not gonna get what you want. So she does that very well. Her older brother actually goes off to Princeton first. So this is not something that didn't seem obtainable to her or to her family. Um, it's still unfathomable to me, but to her and her family, it wasn't. Um, she did know at an earlier age that her father had been diagnosed with MS and struggled through that. She denotes that when she went to high school, her mother went back into the workforce um, to maintain their private school tuitions. But she talks about all those things again very positively and in a very positive way. She uh, did follow her brother to Princeton where she found that community to be the least diverse she would ever experience, Princeton. But again, continued to thrive. And then of course, with all of that ambition, went straight on to Harvard Law School, which again, for most of us, is a real big jump. <laughs> like, wow, Harvard Law School. But for her, no question. Um, she'll even go on to talk about, even though it's her memoir, there are these, these um, times where the paths come together of her and her husband's and his own journey with graduate school, which was after hers, which was after hers and was not a straight line and not a straight trajectory. But for her and the sense of achievement, that's where she was. And then, it was, then she moves into, at the end of the Becoming Me section, she's a young adult. And this is where she first encounters this young Barack Obama, who shows up to her law office as an intern assigned to her. Of course, he was quick to tell her she was not his boss. She was quick to remind him that she was. And, uh, and that um, dating him would be highly inappropriate. Um, however, he managed to convince her that if the firm really wanted him to come on board, them being in a relationship would uh, help seal the deal. Uh, and, and of course, we all know that is indeed what happened. She moves on into the second third of the book, which is the Becoming Us, where she has this relationship with Barack that is long distance for a couple of years as he went to law school because he was behind her in education. And during that time, she lost her father at a very early age, he was 55. And she talks about her own experience with that um, very vividly and, and relatable to many people who have lost a parent or parents, loved ones. But then she moves into this part of her life that seems like our lives. You know, you're married, you have jobs, you're considering what jobs to have and what jobs your spouse will have. And there, become, there comes a point very quickly after Barack comes back to Chicago from graduate school and they get married and then he goes off on some, you know, find yourself, write a book mission and then comes back again. <laughs> and there's some point where there, she really realized that she was going to be enveloped by his character. And this quote that I have on the screen, I was deeply, delightfully in love 
with a guy whose forceful intellect and ambition could possibly end up swallowing mine. I saw it coming already, like a barreling wave with a mighty undertow. This was a fiercely independent woman who was acknowledging that she was going to move into a time and period of her life that was more like her mother's. More like her mother's and less like the Mary Tyler Moore show that she talked about a lot. So, uh, she, she makes that transition. She talks about their early marriage. She talks about their, her, the career changes and decisions she makes, um, the impact she liked to have, the juggling of being a mother working full time with a husband who was largely not there um, because of his uh, career and needing to be the one to do all of those things. And in that period of the book, that's where I would say you and I might find that the most relatable. But then that changes because um, no one in this room has been married to the president. I can say that with 100% assurance. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm wrong, please introduce yourself. But it is in that change, this becoming more section, this final section of the book, where she takes you through not only the things that we know from being present and living during this time and watching the news and watching the internet and watching the Obamas and watching all of this unfold, she talks to you about the things you don't know about just wanting to take her kids for ice cream, about just wanting to open the window and not being able to do that, about being waited on and not wanting to be, about um, wanting to have your children have a normal life in a completely abnormal situation. And she talks about that with all of the pride and all of the distress that comes with that kind of role. We all know from our experience that she chose a platform to be the least offensive or aggressive as possible in her role as First Lady. She didn't take on the war on drugs. She took on healthy eating. She didn't take on national health care. She took on healthy eating. And not because, just because it's a passion of hers, because it was. She talks at length about how she really changed her, uh, lowered her standards with Barack because he smoked when they met. And she didn't like smokers because her parents were smokers. And she found that a very unhealthy, distasteful habit. So health consciousness was always a part of her, but to choose that as the route and the platform to uh, make a difference and an impact in a nation was her route to doing so without being labeled as aggressive um, or offensive to the fringes. And I think we'll all agree that she did that well um, but still effective in making it known that America has a childhood obesity problem and that that is a, a, a national crisis that deserves that kind of first lady status. And of course, the becoming more um, ends with where they are today. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as I go through some of the strengths of the book um, and some of the weaknesses, because there are some, um, of every book, I would assume. But I want to make sure I talk, touch on her target audience. So when you write this memoir, who are you writing to? And there's this very strong theme throughout of 
this mother, she's a very motherly person with a strong connection to her own mother and what mothering was. She had an excellent example and it was very important to her. And she tried hard to be both that staunch, powerful career woman and that same mother to her children. And I do believe that, um, that the primary audience for this book is her children. Um, that's my take on it. You may have your own. We'll debate it over coffee. But that's my take. I think another piece of her audience, target audience, is Americans in general. Because remember, a part of this is, a part of a memoir is to keep memories alive. And as America has moved on from the Obama family to a new administration and more administrations to come, wanting to make a place, keep a place in Americans' minds about her and that family, um, it was important. I think she wanted women to be a target audience. She spends a lot of time talking about this book with young women I think she wants to continue that inspirational um, track and of people of color. She talks a lot about being the first of, and the first of in many rooms um, and in many ways in her life and career. And this is a great role model for uh, everyone to, to look up to and aspire to. So I think, though, I think those were her targets. She may, she may have others that she would state in a conversation. I want to go through the strengths of this book. It is well written. You wouldn't expect anything else. Um, any, any Harvard grad should be able to write and have a vocabulary. <laughs> and she does, uh, a, a, a great one. She does engage you with real emotion. Um, there are times where you can feel her crying, smiling, laughing. It's very well written in that way. Uh, another key strength is that it humanizes a celebrity. She is a celebrity. She doesn't accept that title, but that's what she is. But it humanizes her with some real life struggles, things that us non-celebrity humanoids deal with. She had modest beginnings. I would not use the word humble. I would use the word modest because she did not have humble beginnings. She had modest beginnings. She did have a father with MS and that struggle, knowing that in his pride of trying to disguise how that impacted his life and their life. Her issues with fertility, challenges in relationships, um, career struggles, and that juggling of motherhood, being a wife and those professional goals. And as I said before, being the first of so many things. And that fishbowl life of being in the White House um, and being a senator's wife prior to that too. But most definitely of being in the White House. She showed readers more than the public experienced. So it is not just a chronological review of all of the news reports for eight years. That I can tell you. And it's a key strength. Some of the weaknesses, you know, despite great attempts, it is still very hard to connect her to the, in her experience to the everyday person. You know, there are points where you can, and you're like, oh yeah, that sounds normal. And then there's the talks of the inaugural balls and meeting Nelson Mandela, of which, again, no one in this room, I think, has been. So there are pieces of her life that are reachable and understandable, but there are definitely pieces that are not. And I'm not sure she does a good job with understand, like reflecting on that herself. And that comes through in her writing. I do also agree that it is, a, it's safe. 
Um, she doesn't say anything that is polarizing at all in this book. Maybe she'll save that for another book where she expresses some opinions uh, um, outside of discussing her family life. Um, but it is definitely a, a safe read. No one will be harmed um, by <laughs> reading the book and no names had to be changed. Um, <laughs> once again, that will happen in my book, so. Um, it's also not grippingly interesting. That's, that's my word for it. You know, when you grip a book and you can't put it down till it's done, this isn't one of them. You will read it um, because it's interesting and it's well written and you wanna know and you like Michelle Obama. Uh, but it's not gripping. It's not the book you carry around until it's done. Um, and it does read like the world's longest Oprah Winfrey interview. It really does. <laughs> in fact, I was imagining Oprah on the couch and her on the chair and the little, and the, the, the things going on. So it really, and that's a good thing, but it is, it is that way. So it's, it's safe in that way. You know, no one would go on one of those interviews and say, you know, all these outlandish things and, and or jump on couches unless you're Tom Cruise. So those are some of the weaknesses, if you can call them that, um, but those are some of the things that I say to consider. I, I want to touch on the, did she achieve the objectives that she set out to achieve with this book? In my opinion, she was truly successful in taking readers on a journey throughout the challenges and the triumphs of her life. The other really cool thing about this book is it's full of pictures. Some of us like pictures. I like pictures. And there's lots of pictures of her in this day and age, but pictures of before she had to share with us. And she did. I will also say that she achieved the objective of making her family look the most normal in the White House. <laughs> yeah, and she gave the most normalized view of it, that it is a weird place to be. And it's your house for eight years if you're lucky, and it's a weird place to be. Um, and sometimes weird in a grand way, and sometimes just weird. And raising small children in a family way had not, is not often done in that house, so. This was a, uh, a normalized view of it. And last but certainly not least, like everything else, in my opinion, that she has done since she's graced the, the world with her presence has been to keep it classy. It's a classy book. It's a classy book. She's a classy lady, and it's a classy book. Um, it is, and, it, and if that was, her goal to stay in alignment with the way she does things, she accomplished that, hands down, hands down. It would be a much classier read than mine. <laughs> I've never said I was classy. Uh, my recommendations on this book is 100% that you should own it. 100% that you should own it. If you choose to read it a little by little, or maybe not at all, 100% own it. Buy it for other people, send it to them as gifts, because this is something that people should have. I know you all have books in your house that you haven't read. I know you do. <laughs> so do I. But this is one you should have. 100%, and you should give it to as many people as you can. It is the perspective of the first African-American first lady ever. That's enough to buy the book and to own the book. I, I, wanna, I wanna read this quote to you from the book. We were the 44th first family and only the 11th family to spend two full terms in the White House. We were and would always be the first black one. 
I had hoped that when future parents brought their children to visit, the way I brought my children when their father was a senator, they'd be able to point out some reminder of our family's time here. I thought it was important to register our presence within the larger history of the place. So I say again, you should own this book. The book is better than it should be. That's a good thing. Um, and it is a reflection of her ability to be substantial in her own right, which is something I think she's toying with these days in her reflection and also probably a part of the creation of this book. That concludes my review of Becoming.